Harry Markowitz launched the modern portfolio theory revolution with his seminal 1952 article, Portfolio Selection. Since then, the investing world has changed dramatically. Modern portfolio theory has gone from the halls of academia to investment management mainstream, or from gown to town, in the words of the late economic historian Peter Bernstein. In recent years, we've witnessed booms and busts. Partly as a result, we're now observing a radical rethinking of how investors should approach markets, including whether we're getting the benefits of diversification that we've expected. Harry started this revolution in investment thinking 58 years ago. He's been an advisor to research affiliates since we launched the firm in 2002. It's a special privilege for me to interview you on how the investment world has changed and where we might be going next. Thank you for your kind words. Mm -hmm. Thank you for inviting me here. Harry, many in our industry regard portfolio selection as the single most important paper of the past century. Your paper was the first to codify and quantify the benefits of diversification. At one of our advisory panels, you shared some research showing that when it comes to risk, past is not necessarily prologue. Empirical measures of historical risk, whether standard deviation of returns, skewness or kurtosis, which a lot of people refer to as the fat tails of a distribution, are poor predictors of the future. Given this perspective, what do you say to those who ask whether diversification just simply failed investors in 2008? Well, 2008 uh, was just short of a two and a half standard deviation move. Mm -hmm. Now, moves on to the bad side, uh, you look at the histogram of annual returns on the mm -hmm. S&P 500, big Ibbotson's big caps. Uh, the, um, you'll see that uh, the, the 2008, the uh, well, first place, it wasn't the worst. It's not an outlier. Right. It's not even the worst year. It's tied for the second worst year. It was, uh, uh, as I say, just short of a two and a half standard deviation move. Now, moves of, two, if, the, if the curve were bell-shaped, moves of two standard deviations or more to the bad side should have a two and a half percent of the time. In other words, both, ta fat, both tails at five percent, the bad tail is two and a half percent. That's one in year 40. I've been in this business over 58, uh, 58 years, almost going on 60 years. I got to expect a one year in 40 move once right. in a while. So uh, there are daily black swans, but there's never been, I don't say there never will be, but so far there's never been an annual black swan. In the U.S.? In the U.S. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. The, uh, let's talk about 2008. <laughs> let's get back to two, let's get back to the United States uh, in uh, 2008. Um, people say uh, uh, in crises like 2008, all, all asset classes lose money, and therefore, you know, diversification has failed. Now, uh, it's not quite true. It isn't quite true, right? Right. Um, but they say that. I mean, people say things which are not quite true, but, uh, uh, well, government bonds, you know, went out. Last year ever. Yeah. Uh, uh, corporate bonds, I, I keep hearing different numbers, but uh, it is said, you know, by some measures, corporate bonds lost you money in 2008. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, the S&P 500 went down 38%, uh, mm -hmm. roughly. Uh, corporate bonds maybe went down 5%, roughly. Uh, emerging market went down 50% 50, 50 or more, you know, roughly. So it depended on the beta. Mm -hmm. And so if you had a portfolio which was high on the frontier and it was essentially a high beta portfolio, you got hit. Mm -hmm. Like people said, you're going to get hit if this happens. And if you were low on the portfolio and you had a lot of bonds and maybe a little, uh, you know, a little, uh, relatively little equity, you got less hit. So uh, uh, it was a, a good example of, uh, of why you should pay attention to where you are on the mean variance frontier. In the early 1960s, you suggested to then graduate student Bill Sharp that he optimize returns over an individual's lifetime using mean variance analysis. In 1964, instead, he published the Capital Asset Pricing Model, or CAPM. In recent years, you and others have criticized CAPM for falling short of the mark. Bill doesn't disagree. He readily acknowledges many of the vulnerabilities of CAPM. 
What do you think are the most important of those vulnerabilities and is CAPM still relevant to investors? You've hit, there's two hot buttons. Not, not two hot buttons. Two I things. aim for these hot buttons. You aim for these hot buttons. <laughs> <laughs> pow, pow. And then I respond to one and then I forget the other. Uh, Bill Sharp, uh, Bill and I, to the best of our uh, ability to piece it together, date this sometime in 1960. Mm -hmm. And he presented himself at, his, at my door at the Rand Corporation and said, My name is Bill Sharp and I'm. Uh, a student at UCLA. So what I uh, uh, suggested that he look at was the the bill, the the factor models. Uh, if you have um, you know 500 securities, then there if there are 500 you know 500 times 501 divided by two correlations or 499. Mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. There's just too many correlations to Let's do see, individual. That would be a a big number, large number, very large number, right? Um, See, uh, uh, so uh, in 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 the book, I su suggest that there should I call them derived covariances. Uh, now we would call them factor models. So I suggested that Bill look into uh, the efficacy of factor models. Mm -hmm. You know, as, and so that resulted both in his PhD and his first paper, uh, the 1963 paper called the Simplified Model of portfolio selection. Yes. So that was the one factor model. And for many years, one factor model was king until uh, things came, in, uh, came along that uh, sort of said that you needed a richer model of covariance. Uh, 1964 was the capital asset pricing model. And uh, again, uh, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, in order to sol get analytic solution to the question of what would markets be like if everybody uh, assumed mean variance, uh, it was mean variance efficient. Uh, he had to make certain assumptions, you know, like yes. everybody has the same beliefs and everybody can borrow all they want at the risk-free rate. Now, uh, not long after, a, another CAPM came along uh, in which it was assumed that uh, the only constraint was the sum of the investments equals one. and negative investments were allowed and positive investments and mm -hmm. negative investments were interpreted as short sales but that's not really a good model of how shorts work because uh, uh, the uh, if you have a portfolio where x1 is minus a thousand and x2 is plus a thousand and one and the rest of the investments are zero that adds up to one mm -hmm. but that's like giving a thousand dollars to your broker shorting a million dollars of a you know, stock A, taking the million plus the thousand, buying stock B, and that's not how Reg T works. Okay, so either of those uh, uh, constraint sets is unrealistic. Um, in a uh, article uh, that I published in the Financial Analyst Journal, I have an article uh, called uh, uh, Market Efficiency, A Fine Distinction, and So What? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it, the distinction is between the statement, the market is efficient in the sense that everybody in the market uh, knows what the probability, you know, what probabilities are, and do they choose a mean variance efficient portfolio. So in one sense, uh, in one sense of the word, a market is efficient is everybody is, has the correct beliefs and are acting correctly on their behalf. That is to be distinguished from the statement the market portfolio is a mean variance efficient yes. portfolio. Uh, now it turns out that if you make the cap either of those two cap M assumptions about the constraint set that you can borrow all you want at the risk free rate or you can shorten use the proceeds, then it turns out that the market portfolio is a mean variance. Yes. But if you uh, if you don't make those assumptions, then it uh, uh, it it. Uh, be, it will just typically not be true unless a, a very strange accident happens that mm -hmm. something you know uh, something very unlikely happens the market will not be an efficient uh, mean variance efficient portfolio furthermore one of the implications of both those uh, uh, those cap M's 
is that there is a linear relationship between expected returns and betas. In the case where the original Sharp and Lintner cap M, where you had a risk-free asset, then uh, the excess return, the difference between the expected return and the risk-free rate of a security was proportional to its beta, meaning regression against right. the market. Well, that is not true if you don't make the silly assumptions, the silly yeah. assumptions. So all this time, which uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, our colleagues have spent trying to find out whether there's a linear relationship between expected returns and betas or not, are, and, and finding out, like Fama and French say, uh, well, here's a couple of factors that uh, really do affect expected return, but beta isn't one of them. Uh, but you know, finding that there isn't, what they're proving is that you can't borrow all you want at the risk-free rate. Harry, the efficient market hypothesis, or EMH, the notion that markets are perfectly priced for all assets in all markets at all times, is a core assumption of neoclassical finance. What's your view on the efficient market hypothesis and on recent trends in efficient market research? Um, the uh, first place, uh, uh, let me point out that uh, the efficient market hypothesis is not mine. In other words, uh, 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 not going back to its economics route, but the, it got into finance with the capital asset pricing model. The capital asset pricing model is an, equilibri it's an equilibrium model. Uh, it's a hypothesis about the way the way the world works, and it assumed that people acted uh, had uh, acted rationally uh, with these uh, beliefs. And of course, as we said before, it makes uh, further assumptions. So, my official answer, as a you know, as the original portfolio theorist, uh, is uh, that's not my problem. That's not my area. Um, oh, I, I, actually, as a portfolio theorist, I, I might point out that. Uh, uh, if it were true, if all the assumptions of Cap M were true, and all you had to do was leverage or not leverage the market portfolio, then you wouldn't need most of my 1959 book, which has to do right. with how to do this subject constraint. Right. So, so uh, uh, if if Cap M is precisely true, I'm out of business. But that's okay. I've had a nice run in the meantime. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, uh, Peter Bernstein points out, uh, he surveys uh, the history of, uh, of uh, the, the thoughts of, of theorists. And of course, these theorists have had a lot of impact on practice, as we've been reviewing. Um, and uh, he, he, he reviews the, uh, uh, some of the evidence of the irrationalities of people in the market, the behavioral people who point out the ir irrationalities. He has this very um, interesting observation. Uh, the market may be irrational, but it's very hard to beat. You bring up Peter Bernstein, and uh, that brings to mind uh, a question that I'd be curious about. Uh, Peter was one of my heroes. You're one of my heroes. Peter was one of my heroes, too, so. Who are your heroes? Until about the age of 14, I read Shadow Magazine, not Shadow, Shadow Comic Book, but mm -hmm. Shadow Magazine and uh, mm -hmm. uh, The Green Hornet, but the, the little books I read. Mm -hmm. you know, I would. Mm -hmm. Now, um, around 14 or 15, I somehow got hold of a copy of uh, Darwin's Origin of Species, yeah. and I was tremendously impressed about the way he uh, so systematically went about uh, not only presenting his evidence, but considering alternate hypotheses and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, after that, uh, I read uh, uh, science at a popularized le level, mostly mm -hmm. astronomy and uh, uh, like ABC of relativity, f f physics and astronomy, like the ABC of relativity. But I read uh, philosophers mm -hmm. in the original, and uh, my philosopher by, by far is David Hume. Uh, there is an inquiry uh, into human understanding, where, uh, which is published, you know, or they, David was a contemporary of Adam Smith. They were yes. good pals. Uh, so uh, Hume uh, argued that, uh, uh, he said, uh, just because I release this ball 
you know, I let this ball go and it goes down, you know, a hundred times. I do not have any necessary proof that it won't go up the hundred and first time. It may, but I have no necessary proof. Uh, or put it another way, just because Newton's universal law of gravity had thousands and tens of thousands of confirmations for hundreds of years doesn't mean that some some clerk in a patent office in Switzerland wouldn't find a, a better hypothesis. Uh, so uh, Hume was my philosopher. That, so that's number one. Um, the the next hero, you know, in terms of formative uh, belief, uh, is uh, the next book. Uh, uh, well, there's this little appendix to uh, to theory of games and economic behavior. I mean, Neumann was phenomenal. He was just he's beyond, he's a god. You know, Neumann is just in, incredible. But the the thing that had the greatest impact on me was uh, uh, by Leonard J. Savage, Foundations of Statistics, which uh, convinced uh, many people, including myself, that in acting under uncertainty, you should use you should should indeed maximize expected utility, like Fanon and Morgenstern. Uh, argued, uh, but you should and but you should you should use probability beliefs where there are not objective probabilities, and you should shift these beliefs according to Bayes' rule. As right. so, you can really think of my portfolio theory as the coming together of two lines of uh, research, of thought. One has to do with action under uncertainty, and there is Hume and Leonard J. Savage, and then, as you said, it's got quadratic programming in it, and I, lo I learned an awful lot from George Danzig. So those are my yes. three heroes. So turning attention from the world of theory to the world of practice, there, there are now fundamental index products all over the world. There are new variants that are bond-based coming online this year and next, and the list goes on. Is the fundamental index strategy merely a clever repackaging of value investing, as some of the critics suggest, or is it a better market index, a superior core equity portfolio, an alternative path to value investing, or something altogether different? The way things typically uh, work is you start by choosing uh, asset classes or styles of investment asset classes, and you make forward-looking estimates, and you do frontier. And so you finally ended up with, with an asset class portfolio. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you've got to implement the asset class portfolio. Now, financial advisors to individuals and uh, uh, some in, and many institutions will use uh, uh, index funds, uh, ETFs, to implement. Others uh, fancy that they can choose money managers uh, who can outperform the the benchmarks, the indices. On the average, they don't, but everybody, you know, hope speaks, springs eternal, and people think that they can yes. find money managers. So uh, let's now think about, uh, uh, you know, people on the frontier, different places on the frontier, who are going to implement by ETFs or investment funds. Uh, well, uh, turns out that if those are fundamentally weighted rather than cap weighted, you get a little extra boost. People are starting to notice that. Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's really good. Harry, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. It really certainly has it. been. Thank you uh, for having me, Rob. Harry Markowitz's work has transformed the investment world. He was the first to explain how diversification benefits investors, relating the risk of each security to every other security in the entire portfolio. He la later recommended using semivariance, a measure of downside risk. Harry's optimizer was the basis for decades of practical implementation of portfolios, but he's also aware of the flaws and vulnerabilities in such approaches and is not shy about pointing them out. None of Harry's work has lost its relevance. Diversification and optimization are the cornerstones of investment theory and practice. They are mainstream now. It's how we go about transforming theories into practice that matters. With the fundamental index concept, we think we've exploited some flaws in the neoclassical finance model and hopefully have moved closer to bridging the world of academia with the world of the practitioner. Mm -hmm.